welcome to the Isturu Community's first video cast in a series that is going to try to explain the differences in the definitions of the practice of the seed and the vulva. I am Ivy Mulligan, and as some of you know, I am the Director of Religious Affairs for the Isturu Community. What brings me here today is that there's many people out there who are confused as to what is exactly a seed and a vulva. Hopefully, through these video casts, I can try to explain and clarify what exactly each of these paths are and what they mean, at least to me. I teach a year-long apprenticeship course on the arts and skills of learning this newly reformed and reclaimed uh, mystic practice of heathenism. So I feel that it's very important that clarification is given to exactly what definitions and meanings of these paths are. I'd like to start off by saying that a seed and a vulva are both a religious, ecstatic path on the normal Asturu heathen um, Norse pagan tradition. Norse paganism in and of itself, which we call heathenism and or Asturu, is basically a pretty straightforward way of venerating the old Norse gods. They have bloats that they perform, which are known as sacrifices. Um, they also do an ancestor veneration, and they also do land vitir veneration, which means spirits of the place they give honor to because of the fact that without honoring where you live and the spirits of that place, you're pretty much disconnected from the rest of the cosmos. What makes the difference between a Caesar and a vulva as compared to a standard heathen or Asturu practitioner is the fact that it is a ecstatic religious experience. Now, when I say ecstatic religious experience, I am meaning that it is what we classify as religious ecstasy. It's not in the fact that, oh, it's something that's sexual and or something that is, you know, crazy. But it does walk the fringes of how the average person um, venerates their gods, their ancestors, and the whites and spirits of place. Um, I'll give a definition of religious ecstasy, and this will start uh, this podcast as, as I'm trying to convey it. Religious ecstasy is reported as a type of altered state of consciousness characterized by greatly reduced external awareness and expanded interior mental and spiritual awareness, frequently accompanied by visions and emotional trances. So what that means is that in the Eddas, we have a really good example of um, what an actual Cedar, um experience would look like. It was a woman, and she would sit in what they called the high seat, which I interpret meaning that it was the, a seat of importance. Back in the ancient days, the tribes had earls and kings, and so when a traveling vulva or seether would go to a town, she was so revered for her talents and her qualities that they showed her that respect by letting her sit in the highest seat in the land, which would have been the earl's seat or throne. Um, so they give the seether the seat and they um, let her do her work, which really entailed the fact that she would go into an ecstatic trance to get to the other worlds to access information that was not available to the average person. These sort of informational quests would have been for things like is there an upcoming drought? Is there a tribe that's going to come and overtake us? What course should we take, you know, in the next year to secure that our village and our town is successful and vibrant? She would have the use of her space sisters, if any of them in the town, or maybe she would travel with some of her sisters, which literally could have been um, family, and they would all get together and start to work uh, spa or spay, which was that they would begin to get into a, a state of a static uh, trance. And usually it was done via chanting, via singing, but mostly it was the idea that there was an intention for her to go into the other worlds and seek with the idea that they would gain, give her power, lend her power by chanting and having the same intention that she had. So they were both mostly 
opening the gates for her and getting the energy built and then she could travel further alone and find the answers that she sought. In today's world too, we find many um, authors who brought Seethe to the forefront by, dis by describing it as an oracle type of thing. Um, so when we say oracle, that means that you are actually like the Greeks from Delphi, you are actually being a vehicle or a vessel for something otherworldly to enter your being and to prophetically speak through that person. Um, it's a form of possession. But to me, that's not the only thing that a seed does or did. She, that was one of her talents, that she could be an oracle and that she could be um, a vessel for other worldly beings to speak through her for the benefit of the tribe. But I also feel that she was a shaman, which was somebody who learned healing arts, who learned skills of, of um, herbal care, who could counsel and could actually somewhat probably have good insight as to the ways of the laws of the land and how things could unfold if done in proper manners. I akin a seether very much to a druid, to the fact that um, a druid in its highest state was someone who not only could divinate and could heal, but they could also counsel and actually um, help to make sure the laws of the land were seen correctly through. Now, we define this differently from a vulva and how. Well, again, the Eddas and the sagas show us that a vulva seemed very similar in her duties as well. She would travel from town to town. Um, she had a, a stab that she would use as her magical weapon, for lack of a better word. And um, she was somebody who would see prophecy. She would speak um, divination and she could curse and she could heal. So how, what is the difference between the two? In my personal feeling, it was terminology probably of the towns and or the people, the cultures. Remember that Norse, uh, Demograph took up a large area. We today know them from as different countries from Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Germany, um, all the Germanic and Teutonic pla uh, places had different ways of saying things. Their languages were a bit different and their cultures and customs were a bit different as well. So I'm thinking when Snorri wrote down his definition and his versions of the myths and stories that he had heard, he was taking different um, uh, terminologies and he was putting them into the same context because their duties were very similar. Today we are trying to reconstruct how to utilize these ancient arts as many people are drawn to them from various other paths as the gods and rites and uh, ancestors call them to, to be a modern day seed and vulva. Um, I feel that that entails that we have to start not looking so much as the definitions as they were, but also what they are to us today meaning looking at other cultures that have survived, saying the Sami, for example, that is who I am highly influenced by, the Mongolians um, and other shamans that are pretty much still practicing their cultural heritage um, as it was for thousands of years. And I say that we should take their examples and kind of Put them in context as to what we're trying to accomplish with our spay spa work today. Um, going back to the idea of ecstatic uh, belief systems, I think that to really keep that in mind, that really puts a new light on the idea of the work of a seed and a vulva. Um, when we know that we're stepping outside of ourselves and looking for new means of reaching an ecstatic state other than just standard ceremonial ritual, we realize that that is a way to access knowledge and information of our ancestors and also to, to bring forward in today's world useful practices that help us become adept at these paths. Um, 
to reach a state of ecstatic uh, religion or mysticism, you have to look at other cultures outside of your own, as our Norse ancestors did, to figure out what methods work, which ones are effective, and which ones seem to be consistently used by a mass um, demographic of, of different cultures. So for me, that means that one of the things is that we look into the idea of trance states and how to get there. Um, a lot of body movement to me is very important. Things like, um, well, as the seeds do, shaking, uh, dancing, um, repetitive motion, drumming, um, starving, which is something that was newly developed by Carrie Toring, um, and it's a rhythmic use of the actual stav and chanting to get us to a state of altered consciousness. Um, I also find that uh, to induce ecstatic states, sometimes it can be something as simplistic as walking, hiking, um, something that's monotonous, mundane, and repetitive. That really helps to get one into a altered state of consciousness. But the thing that we want to take away from is the word ecstatic, ecstasy. Um, it should be something that is so moving and so powerful that it removes you from your state of mundaneness, that um, it elevates you to another dimension of knowing and awareness. Um, I like to also address in this particular um, video cast the idea, too, of um, how mysticism and um, ecstatic mysticism especially tends to be the realm of women. And it doesn't mean that men can't do this. That's the furthest thing from what I'm trying to say. However, um, I have found that even in the Eddas especially, uh, it is really made known to us as an important fact that Odin was taught by Freya, a man was taught by a woman to achieve the states of seas. And we have to ask ourselves why. Um, I believe personally it's because that when a man is very masculine and um, brought up with the idea of masculine identification, it's very difficult for him to be um, open to the idea of releasing himself into an ecstatic state because it does release a bit of control. Um, the male personification of the human condition is basically one of of drive of control of being um the master of his domain and so to learn to be in an ecstatic state one must give that up must want you must surrender yourself to the um the ecstasy of feeling of being of questioning stuff you you kind of let it go and you say to yourself okay i'm going to accept that there is wisdom here and that there is um something to gain from this strange and um unfamiliar feeling and territory um, that too, to me, kind of defines how the the vulva and the the seether were, if it was a male that was practicing it, were sometimes um, demasculated by you know equating them to a woman, and it wasn't to me that they had to dress a certain way. That wasn't it at all, and it didn't have anything to do with their sexuality either. It had to do with the baseline differences between men and women, which is the idea that a woman is a receptive and opened vessel, whereas a male is a projective and um, focused, I'm not going to say closed vessel, but they are more um, pinpointed into their their direction as to what it is they need to do and where they need to go. Um, a warrior is a great example. Um, if you are a warrior of any culture, even up into today's world, you are very specific. You are very um, knowing as to what direction you need to go, and you don't deviate. You don't question. You do. Um, so... I find with the ecstatic mystic uh, paths of the seed and the vulva, uh, that is what makes it different from the rest of mainstream heathenry. 
we aren't just going about doing a bloat um, where we honor our ancestors, the land, the tier, or our gods. We are actually accessing them. We are actually trying to go into their realms and learn and see things from their perspective. So in doing so, we become open vessels to um, the ecstatic experience. For some people who are especially control oriented this can be a very scary and difficult thing to accomplish. So um, the path of the seed and the vulva aren't necessarily for everyone, nor should they be. It's something that is an art that is used to access things that the average person just can't or won't. So today, basically, um, I just want everyone to take away from this podcast uh, the fact that uh, definition of what exactly a seed and a vulva were is no longer as important now as it is to what we will be. We know that they have similar aspects, they have sim similar attributes, and I find that if you even lump in a Norse shaman in that same category of definitions, it encompasses all you need to know. And to me, all three of these paths, the seed, the vulva, and the shaman, are all the same thing. They just go about it in possibly a few different techniques um, with a few different arts and skills um, because of the cultural heritage and teachings of the particular uh, practice. But truly, um, they are all intertwined. They are all inner um, transposable, and they are all one and the same. So, um, yes, if you feel that you would like to travel along these paths, don't get hung up on the idea of terminology because though giving something a name and giving it a term as to what it does or what it means is important, but the terminology cannot do any benefit if it kills the idea of this art and craft being newly created and um, newly revised for the modern world so that we may pass it on to our ancestors for them to modify and evolve along with the human race. Well, I'm running out of time here, so um, excuse the ramblings. Uh, I hope that you will join me again the next time um, that I continue this conversation. And uh, your feedback is very appreciated as well as looked forward to. So until the next time, hail and well met, and may the fates bless your path.